if you're not working for minimum wage, now you're saving a lot of money, a lot of time. And it's, it's very valuable to have press jockey find and filter thousands of requests for you so that you don't have to do that. Hello, 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 and welcome to the My Future Business Show. It's Rick Nusky here. It's great to have you back with us. It's uh, also something I'd like to just share with you is just how much pleasure I get out of looking at all of your feedback, going through all the notes and all the comments that have been made across social. It makes a great deal of difference knowing that the show's making a difference. So thank you very much for your support. Now on today's show, I have the pleasure of welcoming the best-selling author, CEO of Digital Vision Media Group and founder of Press Jockey, Mr. Kale Camden. Welcome to the show, Kale. Uh, thanks for having me on, Rick. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Pleasure to have you here. And we're going to have a great conversation on, on various topics today. But uh, we're going to be obviously covering what you need to do to successfully scale tech companies and your unique approach to growth, digital marketing, PR, and business strategy. So there's certainly a lot to unpack here. But uh, where are you calling in from today, Kale? I'm currently in Toronto, Canada. Ah, oh, uh, fantastic. Around, yeah. Very nice. And that's home for you? Yep. Now tell us what you love about the place. Um, the diversity is probably the number one thing. I just have lots of family and friends here as well. So Excellent. Now tell me a little bit. I, I love to talk um, in some depth about our life as we, as we grow from children into adults doing what we do best. Now, what can you remember of your childhood? Do you have any fond memories that, uh, that you'd like to share with us? Watching the city grow from you know, a relatively quiet place of you know about a million million and a bit people to over five million people now. So and is uh, ice hockey a big thing over there? Do you follow oh. sports? What's your thing? It it is it is a big 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 thing here. <laughs> I believe the Toronto Maple Leafs are one of the most valuable franchises in the world. Um, but I do not follow sports. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm, I'm a bandwagon jumper here and there. So okay, um, so you like if, to if, flip between different yeah. things and. Yeah, if, if, if Toronto is doing well, then obviously I'll, I'll start to pay attention. Um, but I, I, I don't I don't <laughs> Oh, I love it. You're very much like me. You jump on there and, and wave the flag when it's relevant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you like a movie now and then? What do you What do you like to do? Do you have some anything like uh, hobbies? Yeah, I like I like. Uh, I don't know if you've seen The Big Short. Yes. I do like that movie. Yeah. So from Michael Lewis, I think that's a great movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also like his other movie, Moneyball. Um, so I'm a big Michael Lewis fan. Uh, reading a book of his right now, actually, called Boomerang. So, um, yeah. It's interesting that you talk about movies a little bit because uh, it's the basis of really great um, storytelling, which I'd love to ask you a little bit uh, about later on. But um, before we yeah, do that, yeah, before we do that, I'm wondering if you could um, share with us um, because. There's lots of entrepreneurs, startup business owners and the likes that were going just about to start to walk uh, a path that you've already walked. So what does a daily routine um, look like for you? Are you an early riser? And what do you suggest to those who are just starting out? Yeah, so I don't wake up to an alarm anymore. I, I typically wake up naturally between, I guess we'd call it 6 and 7.15. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, from there, it's it's prepping for for the for the day in terms of you know a regular coffee, food. I make food. I um, you know I make my own food typically, yeah. um, or, or or I do with my partner and yep. uh, her and I her and I do that. So um, yeah, we make food and then off to the office, and it's just a lot of meetings, calls, you know, some deep work in terms of writing, strategy working on product, that type of thing. Now, I know given how busy you are, this is where I guess the, the really important stuff comes through when we talk to people like you or who are on their way. You get up, you're busy, you're straight into it. But how important is it for you, Kale, to have some time away from the business and relax to recuperate and just to reset? Yeah, I think, I think it is. I think it's increasingly important as you go on. Mm. I don't do that too frequently. Um, I do try and take Sunday off, yep. just like away from, almost away from all technology. I, I, I'll watch a movie, but you know, I don't, I don't really, I'm not on my phone. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on social. I'm, I don't touch my computer. Like, you know, none of that. 
And I tell you, um, that so, must be difficult because you know I know how difficult it is. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it is. It is. It can be very. It can be very challenging. But I think it's important, as you said, to to have a bit of a break. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, I don't really take vacations. I'll, I'll take you know a couple of days long weekend, and and then I suppose during the kind of Christmas holidays, I, I do take uh, you know four or five days just to hang out with family and and do nothing else. You know. You can't get that time back, can you? Now I. I'd love to uh, talk a little bit about, in fact, great deal about um, entrepreneurialism and how it applies to you. I remember when I was growing up, Kale, about five or six, maybe, and I was washing cars. What was your first ever experience? Um, I think I, it was probably a paper route. Yes. I mean, I think about it, <laughs> On the push you know, bike. Back, back when those things, back when those things were actually I jobs. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think that's that was probably my first one. Um, and then, yeah, I ended up having a lot, I've had a lot of, a lot of various jobs and positions over the, over the years, you know? Yeah. Where do you get your ideas from? I know that you've got a lot of involvement in different sort of um, fields. Do you, do you like monitoring certain websites? What's, how do you get your ideas for what you do? Yeah, that's a good question. I suppose ideas come from experience and being in the world. I don't know that this just, just being out there. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, if you're, if you're, I, I don't know, like I, I do, I do consume a lot of content. So that also helps for yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. Like I consume a lot. Like I read a lot of, uh, I read a lot. Yeah. A yep. lot, a lot. Um, <laughs> well, uh, do, you, do, do you like um, audio books? Is that one source for you? I used to, I used to, yeah, I used to, I used to listen to a lot of audio books. I don't so much anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I listen to podcasts, obviously, um, you know, like like this one, and <laughs> um, I read quite a bit, you know, and yeah. and I, I'll read on online, but I also like physical books. And there's just something very tangible, and I believe your memory works differently when you're physically reading a book. Yep. Um, and so I take notes, and yeah, I, so I do that in in combination with being out in the world, trying lots of new I, new ideas and new things. And going through the process of learning how to, you know, do this new aspect of marketing or work with something like ChatGPT, I stumble upon areas that I think, wow, there, I can't believe there's not a solution for this. Like, how come I have to do this X, Y, and Z? Why can't I just do Z and like get to the answer? And so I'll 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 start to you know create ideas from that. Take a quick take a quick path to the answer. Why not? Now, you talked about books and, you know, the tactile nature of a book and how the brain seems to retain information differently when you're reading a physical book. Do you reckon mm. there's still power in the pen? And do you take notes using a pen or are you are a typer? 100% uh, pen. I, yep. I do take notes. So it depends, though. I, I 100% do believe in taking notes via pen. I do think that there's uh, there's been a lot of evidence and and you know studies that have that have shown and i guess we could have someone look that up but uh studies that have shown when you write it actually encodes differently in your memory Mm -hmm. like there is some kind of muscle memory to writing um and so i think that that's very important um and then you know when i'm on calls i i take copious amounts of notes when i'm when i'm talking to a potential client or dealing dealing with someone um you know from a fractional cmo perspective because those notes I can always refer back to, yep, you know, yep. for our team or for whatever it might be. Thank you very much for sharing. Now, uh, for context, uh, Kale, I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your educational and professional background. What sort of studies you've done, if any, um, and you know your role at the moment and uh, things of that nature. What sort of uh, businesses that you're actually running? Sure. So I think. From my perspective, the formal education doesn't really have any impact on what what I've been doing. What you're doing, yep. yep. Um, yeah. So, so I suppose technically I have a bachelor of commerce. I double minored in psychology and corporate communications, but I mean, <clears throat> none of that, like literally none of that, do I use today. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, for anyone who's listening, I wouldn't necessarily equate. Oh, bachelor of commerce, business degree, therefore entrepreneurial in business. I don't, yeah. I don't think that's accurate. You know, I, mm. I really don't. Um, 
So I, I don't, yeah, the, like, I don't think that matters so much. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What I do think matters in terms of education, and, and I'm, I'm sure you're like this because you're doing a podcast on educating people. Yep. And it's finding that education outside of formalized sources that really resonates with you. I think that's what makes a big difference, right? So like listening to podcasts, finding mentors, going to do jobs that you, you know will teach you how to do something like sales or marketing or you know whatever it might be and then reading a lot like consuming a lot of content going to courses online going to seminars webinars those types of things like that's where i think a lot of the learning really uh, comes from so to, to elaborate on that a little bit kale elon musk has very much the, a similar sort of mentality towards it doesn't he he's, he, he, yeah. he's not so focused Great. on that piece of paper I, and I'm I'm glad we have the same thinking. Our bank accounts are are slightly different, but um, not by much. You know, I'm, I'm glad you're making that, that comparison. Thank you. I love it. Now I know that you've had a great deal of involvement in the crypto space. Let's talk about that for a moment. Could you share with us what yeah. that's all about? Sure. So I help crypto-based uh, companies. It's really Web three-based companies. So NFTs, mm -hmm. uh, wallets blockchain protocols, those types of things, scale and grow. And so I do fractional CMO work there. Um, so what does that mean? It's basically your chief marketing officer, the person who would figure out the strategies, the plans, put together the direction of you know, things like branding, marketing, where the company is going, et cetera, and how we're going to get there. That's yep. what I do on, on a fractional basis. And so you know, six years ago, I decided to make a pivot basically from technology to just Web3. And so that's what I've been focusing on ever since. Yeah, because I was going to ask you about that. In Web3, you've, you've said wallets, you've said other things. It, it, just for those who don't really understand it, can we just dig a little bit deeper into what actually Web3 is going to look like if it doesn't already look like it and what it is? Sure. Sure. So I think I think it's important to understand what it is, right? And mm. it, it is it is a it is a fun buzz buzzword, you know. Um, but it, it does talk. It, it does kind of encapsulate what we would typically know as cryptocurrency. So think Bitcoin. Yeah. So you've got Bitcoin being the the OG, the the original, you know, cryptocurrency. That's what kicked off all of blockchain technology. Um, and so you've got cryptocurrency. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, you might have heard of Dogecoin because oh, of yes. Elon Musk, yep. you know, those types of things. Um, and then you have, well, what, what, what do you do with that cryptocurrency? Well, so there's distributed applications that you can use. So dApps is what they're called. Mm -hmm. And then how do you trade cryptocurrency? Well, there's exchanges that are centralized and decentralized. So you, now you've got exchanges just like the stock market. And then you have and different types of protocols. So people will say, hey, well, you know, I like what Bitcoin and Ethereum is doing, but I want, I think we need to go in this direction. And so they'll build their own cryptocurrency and they allow other companies to build on that. So that would be a protocol. Yeah. Um, and so now you're, you're, you know, I've just listed four or five things um, that kind of all interact. And then you've got things like NFTs. Right? Yep. So that's the, the art based and, and non fungible tokens is what they're long form version of it and so all of these things in, are, are encapsulated by web3 and web3 is like you know the, the the upgraded new distributed version of the internet next and gen. how that yes exactly the next gen internet and how that kind of ecosystem of cryptocurrency wallets exchanges companies protocols nfts you know all these things how do they interact that's all under web3 Thank you very much for sharing. Now, I see some utility early on in crypto space, you know, in Japan, predominantly, I recall seeing some, you know, uh, ATM style systems set up there and, you know, QR codes to pay for your shopping in a physical world. Um, now, I'm also seeing nowadays, for example, let's just say the Samsung wallet or the Apple Pay, where you blip your phone, and it's essentially a cashless society. Now, I see some some stark um, consistency between the two but i also see worlds of difference in terms of it being decentralized can you can you see um what's happening in terms of you know physical cash 
starting to slowly but surely disappear and what does it mean for us in the future yeah i think i think i think we we we've seen that just from a natural progression of how we all typically interact with our purchasing right like yep. you, said, you mentioned apple pay there's you know in the united states canada etc you've got debit cards which take money directly out of your bank account you've got credit cards of course and so we've been progressing that way kind of already mm. you know um people are lazy and they don't want to go to the bank account and take out cash and carry cash around mm -hmm. um and so i think we we are you know rapidly moving towards more of a cashless society mm -hmm. but i think that that is very very dangerous um you know we we have seen we have seen countries and and government organizations like china put together a social type of credit score or punishment system that is tied in with your money and so when we look at things like that we we think oh well, that wouldn't happen in a democratic society until until we until we see things like you know what's happened with with uh you know our, our last couple of years in terms of lockdowns and, and changes in terms of our, our freedoms and our rights and yep. so now if we can imagine that tied to money then the work that you're putting in to earn that money and build your wealth is now really at risk of being locked you know taken away um uh, or even if we don't want to go that that far uh, you could be forced to spend it with negative interest rates um you know like and so what does that mean i was just as a little tangent yep. the government might say hey there's too much inflation happening right now and everyone's saving money well we want to accelerate the economy and get back to quote unquote normal so if you've got money in your bank account we're going to put a minus five percent inflation rate on it or sorry minus five percent interest rate on it mm -hmm. every year Mm -hmm. So you'll lose money if you don't spend it. And so you can't really save money anymore. And as a centralized government organization, we can do that because it's all digital money. And so these types of things become very, very scary and you get into dystopian worlds very, very quickly. And so while I do see us kind of moving in that direction of a cashless society, I really hope that a lot of us maintain our ability to have financial freedom by keeping cash alive whether that's in real dollars whether mm. that's in gold silver etc but you know like i do i do think we need to really we, we need to fight for our freedoms consistently and i think that that's going to be a big thing in the future great feedback thank you so much kl now earlier you mentioned chat gbt i've been really interested in, in this uh, rapidly evolving part of the i guess the ecosystem that we live in should we do you think uh, embrace or fear AI? I you know I, I always think oh. about this whole Terminator-like experience with smart robots that have now got, let's say, for lack of better AI, um, better AI examples, ChatGPT embedded in them. They seem to be very smart, very accurate. What do you think? Um, you're asking all the all the difficult questions, or jumping down the <laughs> rabbit hole. Um, I do think ChatGPT is extremely dangerous. Mm. for a number of reasons and we can jump into them but I, so just to kind of caveat that yeah i we are integrating it into press jockey so we are using it we're, we're in the early phases of testing it out mm. so that anyone who's using our tool press jockey to get more press can do it in an easier manner like so we are using it but i do think it is extremely dangerous and, and here's why we're just seeing the first version of let's call it kind of chat ai yeah so this is actually you know it's based off of gpt3 so three is obviously a step up from two gpt2 and a step up from gpt1 mm -hmm. which over the last four or five years um you know emerged as data models and sets that you could then train ai on and it would learn and then give it some type of output or do something for you, right? And so yep, yep. What, what has happened for those who are not familiar is, and I'm gonna give approximate numbers here, you can, you can 
kind of dive in and do your own research. But GPT-2 gave developers, uh, you know, programmers, a data set to work with, with, you know, let's call it 1 billion-ish kind of data points. So you could give it a billion data points or it had a billion data points and you can train it to create certain types of responses. Or you can train it to respond to you based on those data points. And because there's a billion data points, it was all right. Mm -hmm. You know, it could give you answers, but maybe it wasn't super accurate. Okay. GPT-3 has come out as of, you know, late last year or early last year or something like that. And it went from 1 billion data points to, you know, somewhere around 175 billion data points. Wow. So this many times more, like 175 times more data points. And so now you can get far more accuracy with your responses and it's far more quote unquote intelligent in terms of understanding human language. So you say, Hey, can you write me a blah, 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 or Hey, please author a blah, blah, blah. It will understand the difference between write and author in that, in the context of that sentence. And so then it will give you a response, right? And that's like, wow. Okay. So we're at the beginning of this GPT four. So I've heard, um, <laughs> will be something like 10, 20, 30 times more data than what we've got now. And so this is, this is likely going to come out by the end of this year, because it's evolving very rapidly. And then GPT five will be probably 30, 40 times bigger than that. And so you get, you're getting into this place where, wow, the technology is exponentially increasing. And I don't think we have really thought about the implications of that on things like work, on things like how it affects the human psychology in terms of how, where the data is coming from. So there is bias already inherently built into the chat because again, we're talking about data sets, right? And so if I train it on a data set that, you know, everyone's going to know, know these, it doesn't matter where you fall on the political spectrum, but if I train it on a data set from Trump and you know, the, the Republican party, it will mm -hmm. give me different answers than if I train it on Biden and the Democrat party. Right. Yep. And unfortunately right now it's not neutral. So it is leaning in a certain way. And so that can be also amplified in the future. So I think it's very dangerous to then put so much faith and reliability and trust into this quote unquote intelligent AI that is a working off of biased data sets information, yeah. and, and a biased data information. And then B is rapidly learning at a speed that is almost incomprehensible to most people and we've just we don't know what the heck is happening really and you know so i think it's i think it's quite dangerous no if i answered your question no you absolutely have thank you so very much very very interesting space certainly something to look out for now tell us a little bit about pressjockey.com yeah so as, as as you mentioned in the very early phases of of the podcast you know mm -hmm. I, I i am the ceo of digital vision media group and so that's an agency yep for web three companies, right? So we do, I do fractional CMO work and growth advisory. And then our agency focuses on PR. So public relations, content marketing. Um, so think talk, we're just talking about chat GPT content marketing is the number one thing that chat GPT is, is, you know, is, is gunning for. Yep. Um, so content marketing, and then we do paid media. So we only do those three things, PR content marketing, paid media. And so Press Jockey came about because we've been doing PR for clients for years. And, and I thought, ah, oh, there's, there's a number of really interesting sources online, like, uh, called like Harrow, for example, help a reporter out. Yeah. They've been around for a while, haven't they? Yeah. They've been around for, for a long time, maybe 15 years, 12 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. And you can find great PR opportunities on there. There's other sources as well. There's there's about a dozen of them across the web, maybe a, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. And they all have opportunities from journalists, podcasters, bloggers, et cetera, who are looking for experts like yourself to speak. And so we use these tools, right? Mm -hmm. But you have to 
individually monitor each and every one of them. And you have to monitor platforms like Twitter to find the best results. And so we've, we've, we've hired people to just do that. And I said, you know, there's got to be a better way to aggregate all of this data. And, you know, you still have to sign up to those platforms. Yeah. Fine, but, mm-hmm. hey, there's got to be a way, a way to, like, save a lot of time and get better response rates by finding the press requests or the, the expert requests that are best matched to you. And so we built a software to do that. And that software is called Press Job. Ah, fantastic. How much time do you think it saves? Um, so we've, we've been using it for a number of months and we've tested it out. It saves about 15 hours per week per brand. That's a lot, isn't and it? So, yeah, it's, it is a lot of time saved. And you know, if you think about it in whatever country you're listening to and you think, okay, what's the minimum wage in your country? And then you multiply that by 15 hours a week multiply that by four weeks, you know, that's just the minimum that you would be saving. Because my guess is you might not work for minimum wage. And so yeah. <laughs> if, if you're not working for minimum wage, now you're saving a lot of money, and a lot of time. And it's, it's very valuable to, you know, have press jockey find and filter thousands of requests for you uh, so that you don't have to do that. Oh, that's laborious, isn't it? Can you imagine that automating some parts of that process would be fantastic? Now, tell me, I love the name. Where did it come from? Um, well, I was thinking about so consuming content. I was thinking about press, and I was thinking about uh, speed. And you know, I, I, I saw something when when I was reading that it talked about. It was it was, must have been something around. Um, you know, AI and, and computers and someone who had figured out betting and had won, I think it was like a, an article about how, how this, this gentleman had figured out how to beat the jockey races and he had like programmatically figured out how he could win like consistently. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting man. Yeah. That's why you got to give people the edge, isn't it? Now tell me, who's your ideal customer? Is it small, medium or large businesses? Who is it? Great question. So our ideal customer is a combination of agencies. So if you're an agency, you're, you're doing press for other clients. This is a fantastic tool for you because, you know, like us, if you've got you know, 10, 20 clients, 30 clients, you know, five clients, it doesn't matter. Monitoring all of that traffic for multiple clients gets really tedious. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, if you're on a comms team, communications team on a, at a big company, you're tasked with doing this manually, it sucks. Like it just really sucks to monitor all these platforms by yourself. Um, same, same as well if you're a small business. It really just, it's very tedious and time consuming to yep. bounce around between platforms. And so this is perfect for you. Perfect. I can see how somebody would work with your team at Press Jockey and Digital Vision to you know help them get more exposure quickly. Tell me, do you, do you combine the two services like that? We do have an option for someone who wants everything managed. And mm-hmm. so it will, it will range depending on what you want to do. So if, if it's like, Hey, I just want complete hands off. I don't want to, I don't want to have to deal with any of it. Um, then we can, <laughs> we can definitely help you. Yeah. Now I know that there's a lot of traditional bricks and mortar businesses out there that don't believe that they necessarily need to have an online presence to grow their business. And I, I suggest otherwise, what, do you, what do you, what's your take on that? I also suggest otherwise. I, I would 100% agree with you, Rick. Like I think on online is extremely important. Mm-hmm. I think press can really help you get get ahead in your business. Um, you know, we, we've seen it increase conversion rates by up to 50%. We've seen it drive thousands of users. Like we've seen it do all sorts of things. Um, but it, it really is going to depend on what you're goals are what you're trying to do but if you're a local small business um and you don't have an online presence well you're probably not listening to this podcast <laughs> um but if you are like i would i would 100 percent recommend and agree with you rick like you do need to have an online presence for sure there are certainly hundreds if not thousands of people tuning into the my future business show each and every week so if you're listening to this show uh, stick with us because there's certainly a lot more to come now we started off this call kale talking about movies and how much you enjoy them as do i now 
I also touched on the importance of being able to tell good stories. Now, where does where does storytelling come into the services and uh, that you provide? Storytelling comes into the services in terms of what we do and how we build our templates at Press Jockey. Right. So we've got templates that anyone can use once they sign up, um, and so we we have you know formula to help you get more press responses. Right. It's like a numbers game, of course, mm-hmm. just like sales is. Right. Yep. Um, you're not going to win every pitch that you send out. It's just not going to happen. Doesn't happen. Does but, it? No, it doesn't happen. But if you have a great story, you have good, you have good, uh, a good pitch, and you you you've got a good template that you're working from. For example, one of ours that we've tested over the years, then yes, you have a much higher percent probability of of getting locked in. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where story comes in, in, into into practice and to real world value. Yeah, you talked about uh, not getting um, a win every time. Now, should the strategies that you use with Press Jockey and combined with Digital Vision and all the other services that you pr- provide be considered longer term or are there sort of uh, outcomes that are quicker uh, in terms of wins? There can be quick outcomes with mm-hmm. anything, right? It, now, it really is going to depend on what your story is and what you're what you're doing so for example we have gone extremely hard with outbound you know press like so that would be traditional press where we're reaching out to publications news outlets you know tv media etc and we've gotten a ton of traction for really big news you know that that can happen and that can happen quickly 45 days, you know, boom, we're all of a sudden, we've got someone featured on BNN, you know, and yep. it's like, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty amazing. That's Significant. $10,000 and you know, it's the largest business and business show in the world. And boom, it can happen in less than 60 days. But the standard is, it will take a bit of time. You know, you, you, you should be prepared to be pushing your message and your story over a number of months and it, it will grow as you get press so there's there's something i always say is like press begets more press so mm-hmm. if you get press you can use that to say hey i've already been featured in these other places i've already been talked about i i have valuable things to offer your audience as well um but again that does take time you know people take time to respond and etc cetera, etc cetera, right? it can be the comp- compounding effect isn't it yeah it is absolutely and, and that's exactly what happens with press, right? But that happens with everything in, 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 not everything, but almost everything with business, right? It compounds over time. Yeah, look, I'm absolutely loving this call as uh, the audience that have joined us today. Kale, thank you so very much. Now, tell us when somebody wants to work with you, how do they engage with you? Where are they going to find you? And what's the onboarding process? Right, so if you want to go to www.pressjockey.com, um, people can jump in and take a look around for free. You can't really respond to anyone, you know, uh, but you can put in a number of keywords. You can see what kind of responses uh, or what kind of requests have been have been there. Yep. You, can, you can see what's going on for free. You know, Press Jockey starts right now. We've we've discounted. It starts at around you know forty five dollars a month. So mm-hmm. it's it's very inexpensive for monitoring thousands of requests for you. Um, and again, it saves you about 15 hours a week. So it's a lot of time. <laughs> Thank that you very much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's, so yeah, it works out to about you know, 10, 12 bucks a week uh, for press jockey. So that's, that's one, of, one, of, one of the starting points. And then, you know, if, if people want to have more of that traditional PR approach, completely hands off, you want someone to do it for you, sit down with you, build a story, build a pitch angles and reach out to the media then you can connect with us at Digital Vision. And so um, you can just reach out to hello at digitalvision.io. There you go. Look, everybody's on this call today. I'm sure they've taken away a great deal of uh, value, including insights to your personal journey, which we very much appreciate. And uh, for everybody's on the call, remember it's pressjockey.com 
or if you're looking for other parts of this entire experience, go to digitalvision.io. But again, all of the links will be uh, available to you below this post, no matter where you see it. So make sure you reach out to Cahill and his team. And with that, Cahill, thank you so very much for joining me on the My Future Business Show today. Thanks for having me on, Rick. I really appreciate it. It was a great conversation.